Welcome to part three of our walk through Matthew Pajot's book, The Language of Creation, Cosmic Symbolism in Genesis. We've covered the author's background so far and how he lays out the structure of his book in part one. And in part two, we review the content and the meta symbolism of the book itself, as well as the roles of the author and his brother, Jonathan. You're probably to the point of asking, yeah, but how did it impact you? What changed in your life because of reading this book? Well, in this video, I'll be sharing how the book has impacted my perspectives as well as my actions. I'll also give a few suggestions to new readers and a further reading recommendation to those who have read the book. In true Pajovian fashion, I have entitled the two sections, Heaven and Earth. Firstly, Heaven. How has this book changed my perspective? Upon reading this book, it feels like a pendulum swing from my predominantly literalist upbringing. The book has really helped me get outside of my inherited worldview, something similar to learning a second language. It's been a necessary exercise in finding the, the center between the two. Sometimes it feels like you swing from one side and then back to the other, but the idea is that the swings are less and less dynamic and you get closer to center. One of the, the main takeaways that's helped my perspective shift is that we need both. We need the perspective of mechanical causality as well as cosmic language. We also need that of symbolism and literal approaches. And in page 23 of the book, Peugeot writes, ideally, we should be able to adopt both perspectives without having to sacrifice one for the other. Also, let me pull up in the footnote of page 25. He writes, this does not disallow for fictional stories in the Bible, but an a priori refusal to admit the coexistence of fact and meaning creates equally mistaken tendencies. First of all, focusing on the metaphorical to systematically shed doubt on the factuality of biblical events. On the other hand, abolishing higher meaning to protect the integrity of the fact. When presented with the question, so is this historically accurate or is it symbolic? The answer would be no, yes. There's a place for both. It's really helped me break down this dichotomy of, of science versus religion as well broken down some of the good guy and bad, bad guy or us versus them, help me see that there's more of a, a way of seeing how these, these things relate to each other and in the, the proper place as well. I ask different questions now. So I, I do find myself asking quite often, what is its meaning? Or how is this scalable? That is, how does it work in the, the micro and the macro level? where I see something, say, in like the communal level or the national level, and I ask my, to myself, I'm like, okay, is that something that's happening, that same pattern within me, within the individual level? Guys, I have to mention that this is not to say that I don't have reservations or, or even hesitations, perhaps confusions, too, about the book. But by and large, this book has far helped clarify than it has confused brought a fresh wind into otherwise stalemate topics that I've been wading through as well. For example, understanding Christ as the Word or the eternal Logos made flesh. Uh, this work on cosmic language has really opened my eyes up and, and put me right back on to the, the trail of understanding these things further. Um, I'm finding that I'm uh, testing Peugeot's work more and more in the New Testament as a whole and seeing how these things line up or apply, or if they don't. If you guys are interested in hearing more about the application of Peugeot's work in the New Testament, just let me know in the comment section below, and I'll see if, if I can share some of the, the things worth sharing, the insights that I come across. Part two, Earth. What are the practical ways that this book has changed how I act? I have to say that it's, it's changed how I even structure my days. I, I see things as working and building order or building a house, building a business, a city even, uh, caring for a garden as the domain of space, let's say. And then I have more of a respect of the domain of time and the ability to wash the end of the day in the evening 
with this mini flood, if you will, through recreation, through music, through games, play, meals, gathering around a fire pit, looking at the stars. I, I, I find that these distinctions are, are helping me have a, a energetic, a holistic life where I can give myself more fully to, to the domain of work as well as the domain of, of rest. I have found that it really helped me clarify what to do with work, but then also to prioritize the Sabbath or, or rest, where I say no to certain things because that's not what we're doing right now. Uh, I understand the benefits and the limits of work. Also, I, I seem to guard my times of rest with more diligence. Don't even mess with my Sunday naps, I'll just say that. But also on Saturdays, I give myself more to to uh, service or helping out friends or doing things that I normally don't do during during the week, and that's really revitalized me, helped me start the new week afresh. While I work, I, I don't listen to music or I don't bring in recreative things unless it's perhaps like a, a mini, mini uh, flood, like a break time where I'm, my thoughts are stacked up or I'm getting a little bit hazy, overworked, then I'll let issue in a mini, mini flood of a break. But outside of that, I don't do things like listen to music while I'm working or focused on the work at hand. Uh, I do play more music, be it the piano or guitar or banjo, or whatever, uh, especially with my family or in the church that I'm a part of. One of the most helpful paradigm shifts for me that created more of a practical way of how it changed how I act is ornamentation. His work on the symbolism of how ornaments work or tools or instruments, it, it just struck a chord with me and immediately I began changing things and it, it helped me understand how to exercise power over my tools and make sure that my tools do not have power over me, that they enhance or extend me in my work, not overtake me. It helped me put my smartphone in its place. We'll say that. It's changed how I act in my church as well. I, I see the importance or the utility or even the inevitability of sacred symbolism in my faith. I am taking rituals much more seriously. I take the built environment or space much more seriously too. You know, like, how does this object placed in this place and orientation of the things around it and the you know, geometry of the building and where the people are at, how does how does that fit with everything else? Is it cohesive? Does it say a message in and of itself silently without us having to explicate everything? Finally, it's really helped me in how I act with my family. I've incorporated more symbolic practices. For example, uh, we, do a, uh, we light a candle to initiate our prayer. When we're done, we blow it out. My daughter has just taken it. It's amazing how children respond to the rituals or, or symbolism in especially as they're embodied or carried out. There's been days where she's asked me seven times at least, candle, candle, pray. At two years old, she's already really engaged in these activities. It's changed our priorities too. Gardening is uh, really more of a, a sacred practice to it. We've been taking it more seriously and more engaged even in our community garden too. Just as Isaiah says, like we are, a well-watered garden. You are a well-watered garden, so you care for it as such. You pull out the weeds as soon as possible, proactively, and you care for it. My two-year-old daughter, she's become way more active in the garden, too. Family time is also sacred, where we remember loved ones, or we really carve out time to enforce the identity of who we are and what's important to us. We prioritize our nighttime routines too. Like, and before nighttime routine was like, whatever we have to do to get my daughter low down asleep. But now it's so life giving. Uh, it, it's so much more intentional too. My final thoughts. This the the general overview of the language of creation. I find it to be the foundation of Brother Jonathan's work. So if you are at all involved in the symbolic world or have watched some of his videos or all of them, it really helps fill in some of the gaps that maybe Jonathan just hints at or doesn't have the 
time to go over in a, a short amount of time for a 15 minute video where Matthew's book does and presents a, a fuller picture. And ultimately, I'd say this work is in that of being intriguing or provocative and on purpose. And my hope is that others in academia would take this work further, that theologians like Alistair Roberts, what he's doing, his work, talk to other works, so to speak, and really speak symbolism to that level as well, because I do believe there's an important place for that. Also, I hope that Christians are able to read this book and help them think outside of the materialistic culture, cultural view that perhaps we've inherited all around us and so pervasive, and help us get inside the cosmological view of our not-so-ancient heritage. I also hope that it helps non-Christians understand an important aspect of religious life and how religious or spiritual people see the world, or even, even just people that are interested in, in symbolism in general who can learn a whole lot from this book. I also hope that it provokes those in media to consider symbolism in storytelling. For example, the work of storytellers in their YouTube channel. And to help make quality decisions about how to condense and disseminate information. Next up is the advice for new readers. The best way I would suggest approaching this book is that of a second language. Now, learning Spanish came with equal amounts of laughter and tears for me. Um, I, I, I have to ask, too, how long does it take to learn another language? Is it six months? Three years? Not overnight, I'll say that for sure. I would say it's best read in waves. That is, go until you're stretched, but not past the point of being overloaded. Uh, warning, uh, shows say that you can't go crazy in all of this, so take it one step at a time. Uh, also, come back when you've recuperated, you have a fresh perspective, you can bring also with you all of the other things you've learned or experienced, and it really helps illuminate some of the things that might have been confusing the first lap around. Finally, let it challenge you in healthy ways. Really put it to the, the test when you're reading the Bible or how you're seeing these patterns unfold or not in the world. For further reading, I would suggest Matthew Pujot's reading list that he has posted on The Symbolic World. Also check out Alistair Roberts' YouTube channel and blog. I find that his work and reading suggestions are quite complementary to Pujot's work. For more reading on specifically Christian symbolism, I welcome you to join me in reading through the Church Fathers. Also, uh, Bishop Barron just came out with an overview, uh, I think it was two or three parts of the Church Fathers that I found to be quite helpful and a good place to start. I appreciate all of the recent activity in the comments section. Let's keep it up, guys. And let me know if there's any other topics you want me to cover in the book. If I have uh, helpful insights, then I'll publish a video. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, click the like button. Be notified of future videos, click the subscribe button. To support this work, you can do so through purchasing books as gifts to help further the research through the Amazon.com wishlist as well as the thriftbooks.com wishlist in the description below, as well as a, a materials wishlist through Amazon. Uh, financially, you can make a donation through PayPal as well.